Okay, let's settle down and get started. Sorry for the delay. Um, glad you all made it. You all fell in the right building. That's good. Um, do we have the roster going around? Make sure to get your name on the roster so at least you get credit for being here. Um, let's see. We've got um, some administrative stuff to cover first, and then we're going to finish database connectivity. Um, the administrative plus stuff is for the people who just showed up. You haven't heard this yet, but people that were here, this is a repeat of what I just told you earlier. But maybe you'll, second time around, maybe you'll, I don't know, maybe, well, you probably understood the first time. On my website, vhacker.com, and there's absolutely no way I can make that a little bit more focused. It's just going to be what it's going to look like. Um, out there, I've got final exam schedule that's out there. It's a Word file. If you download it, it's going to look like, whoops, it is going to look like this. And it has all of the final exams for the class. In fact, what we're looking at in this particular course, and let me tell you the schedule. This is what I don't like. I don't like my back this way. <laughs> but I have no choice. Next week. Next week, well, ho hopefully Wednesday, we'll be in a different classroom. I'm really not liking this room, if you can't tell. <laughs> all right, so not conclusive to teaching. All right, if we could settle down, that would also be good because this room's got really bad acoustics to it, and I can hear everything everyone's saying. <laughs> and it's irritating me. Okay. Uh, we are in this week. So we have this week, and then we have coming up uh, April, believe it or not. Oops. And in the month of April, we have one, two weeks, and then we have the final exam two weeks. So this is Monday, and this is the uh, Oracle class, and we're going to either be on the 18th or we're going to be on the 25th. I'm going to look at the schedule in a few minutes and let you know for sure, which means if we're not on the 18th, we don't have class on the 18th. We only, the, after this particular week of the 11th, the classes end, which means we don't have regular class session. We have final exams going on. Final exams are going to run for two weeks. This gives us breathing room, gives us time to fit everything in. You must show up in person for the final exam. It must be taken live by you. If you have multiple classes, you can take them at multiple times. You can take them all in the same day. You can take them in the same sitting. You can spread them out. Uh, you have some choices. Uh, but uh, what we're looking at in terms of the timing is a... Uh, Oracle Database is the first one on 418, which means the week before, this is way too loud in here. This is the date of our final exam, which means on the 11th we will have a review session. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know for the final exam for this particular course on the 11th. I'm going to hopefully have everything set up so the recording picks up the audio and everything is recorded properly. So if you miss it, you can watch it on the YouTube video. Better to show up live because then you can ask questions as well. Uh, I'm writing the exam sometime within the next week or so, so it'll be available for you. Uh, excuse me, I'll have the information available for you. Right now I can't, couldn't tell you what's on it because I've written it yet. I can tell you, though, that I'm going to put together multiple choice for everything. It's a little bit easier to administer. Maybe not so good for you because it's kind of hard to hard to cheat or hard to hard to figure out the answers if you don't know the answers. Uh, we're gonna have maybe about eight different versions of the exam put together because we run the exams over two weeks, uh, which means some of you might take it on the 18th. Some of you might wait until the 30th to take it, which means some people would have taken it already. Some people hadn't taken it already. So each version, I have a, like a pool of questions that I'm going to use. I'm going to put together eight, maybe probably for this class, probably about eight, seven or eight different versions of it, which means some of the questions might be completely different. They're all going to be at the same level of difficulty. I will explain everything when we have our review session on the 11th. Uh, but you're not guaranteed to have the same exam, which so hopefully will cut down on the amount of cheating and stuff. Um, also, when you show up for the exam, the exam is uh, partitioned out into uh, different groups. And 
And uh, as an example, you find your last name. Well, you find what the letter your last name starts with. And uh, this is really nice because it's right up front here. Group one through five, these are the timings. And uh, how this works is you show up if you're in group number two between 11 and one. If uh, that's a two, each one of these time slots is two hours. If the uh, you think you're going to take more than two hours, you could stay longer than two hours. That's not a problem. Um, it's not like a it's not like a timed thing where I'm going to pull a plug on you after two hours. I seriously doubt it's going to take anyone two hours. Probably take about an hour and a half, maybe at the most. It's multiple choice, probably about 25 questions or so. Uh, and for in terms of Oracle, you won't have to write any SQL statements. But you might have to look at some SQL statements. You're not going to have to write anything uh, in terms of Oracle, any particular version. It won't be like specific. A lot of database concepts, obviously, there'll be something on entity relationship diagramming, and you know, there's definitely going to be some SQL related questions. But you'll have to look at a statement and say, what is this doing? What is that doing? Or which one of these is most effective? Or which one of these will do this? Or something. Um, so it's not going to be a where you have to actually come up with it. You'll have to look at it and understand it, hopefully. And uh, the way this works is if you don't like your time slot, because let's say, for example, this class is normally at 5 o'clock. Well, so group 5 would work, hopefully, for everybody. But uh, if, let's say, group 5, uh, you're not in group 5, and uh, not everyone can take it at group 5 time. So <laughs> if you're in, like, group 2, but you can't show up at 11 o'clock, uh, what you do is you send me an email message and you tell me which group you want to be in, and I can put you on that list. Because when you show up for your grouping, I'm making it so we have 45-ish to 50 students maximum, so we can spread you out. You'll have a desk, a desk. You'll have a table to write on. Um, it'll be quiet. You won't be. Uh, it'll hopefully be well organized. And so what ended up happening was when you come in, you'll have to show a student ID, write down a student ID. Only one student can take a test once. A couple of years, well, about a year ago when I was running final exams here, I had a group of students who took it like 20 times for like everybody they knew. <laughs> That's not going to work. You, know, you can only take one test with one, with one student ID, one time. We, we put you on a list. I have a roster of everybody. They're all divided out already. We check you off the list. If you're already checked off, you're not getting in unless you happen to change your identity overnight or something. If, for example, you're in this class, but you're also in the earlier class, you pick, no, I, already, I don't need that, I already have one of those. That's not what I needed, but it's okay. And let's say you like group four, and you're in this class, and you're also in the class before this class. You can send me an email message and say, I want to take both of the exams on the same time. This means you show up, you don't have two hours to take both exams, you have four hours. That's how it works. You take three exams, you have six hours. Hopefully, you're not going to take six hours, but you know, if you wanted to, you could sit here in a two hour increments for each one of the exams, as long as it falls within the schedule. Most likely, if you take multiple exams, you'll probably be here for three or four hours, is what I'm thinking. Uh, especially if you're taking like three exams all at one time. Um, the other option you have is I'm, I have two weekend sessions. And uh, so, what we have here on the top, we have Monday the 18th, we have Monday the 25th, which is the uh, object-oriented class, object-oriented database, uh, excuse me, Java class. Wednesday, you can take it on a Wednesday time if you want. This is the times I've set for each one of the classes. We have an exam makeup date on Wednesday the 27th between 1 and 6 p.m. doesn't mean you have to be here from 1 to 6 p.m. All students are available, so if you missed all the other dates, and you didn't hear about it, you just became aware that we have final exams, you can show up on the makeup day. If you show up on a makeup day, uh, like this one here, I need to know that you're going to show up. So you have to send me an email. I said, send it to me, because I have the master list. And I can write you, I can put what group you're next to. And tell me group numbers, tell me days and times. That's the most important. I can switch you around. And as I mentioned before, I've got two weekend classes. One of them's meeting the week of uh, coming up, actually, the 16th and the 17th, which is the weekend right after final exam. So if you're leaving to go back, you know, and you want to leave early, you can take it on the 16th Saturday if you wanted to. Take everything you want on that day. Um, or another option you might want to do is wait until the 30th and uh, May 1st. So it's kind of like the beginning of the month and the end of the month. So there's a lot of flexibility in the schedule. Only problem is, if you can see so far, 
this particular day is booked. There's a lot of student taking because a lot of people don't want to wait till the last minute. I don't know why they want to wait till the last minute. But I've already had a lot of people requesting the Saturday the 30th, Sunday the 1st. Um, perhaps, uh, and they're taking multiple exams, so it's really a heavy, heavy exam day. If you want a peaceful environment, the earlier you take it in the schedule, the, so you're, the, peace, the more peace you're going to have. The more chaotic is if you wait until Sunday, May 1st, where everybody who missed it, which is the last day of the exam, is going to be here trying to take the exam on that day. <laughs> so, I don't know, but if it's the only time you can take it, it's open to you. But uh, the key to this whole thing is I need to know if you're going to change your time slot. If you like your time slot, show up on your time slot. Don't show up before your time slot. If you're late, that's no problem. We can fit you in after the time slot. We just can't fit you in before because I have to make sure I have seats in for everybody who's supposed to be here. So, Questions about the uh, final exam schedule? And this is just the schedule. I'll have a review for you on the 11th, uh, which is uh, two weeks away. No? Okay, good. No problemo. Okay, we stopped about slide number 15. If I remember this right. Yeah, I was as I'm told by my TA. And uh, just catch up, just in case you weren't here last time, We are, this is lecture 7A. Uh, next time I think we're going to be doing uh, reports. We have about two lectures left, uh, so we're slowly winding down. Um, in terms of database connectivity, uh, what we're going to cover today, uh, we've gone through the motivation, we've gone through the concept of attaching through ODBC, JDBC, the driver concept. Uh, what I've got in here is uh, some examples about how the drivers actually work. And uh, I uh, was going to put together, uh, I, was I was actually going to put together some uh, samples, like live. Uh, I ran into a problem, however. Uh, because my Windows partition wouldn't take, <laughs> for some strange reason, wouldn't take 11G. Like I had already installed it, and I had already had it running, and uh, it it wasn't running properly. I uh, kept failing on me, and then uh, the drivers kept failing on me as well. But then I took a look at the slide set again, and I went, well, I probably could get away with just showing you the slide set. Um, and then if I can get it working between the next couple weeks, I'll make a video for it, and I'll tell you the video link. You can actually look at it to see how the JDBC works. Uh, but I, I basically ran out of time and I couldn't continue troubleshooting it forever. <laughs> so, uh, so what we're looking at in terms of the Java support for SQL, uh, which is not where we stopped one slide, we stopped right here. So, uh, We're looking at the Java SQL package and extensions, uh, exceptions, hierarchies that go along with it. If you're taking the Java class, this is a great extension show you the functionality of how it works with Oracle and other databases. As mentioned before, it works with more than just Oracle. You can connect with MySQL, you can connect with uh, all sorts of different uh, client server type databases. And um, in terms of the connectivity, we've got a data source and a driver. Very similar to ODBC and how that used to work. ODBC, we set up the operating system and we defined data sources and we loaded up drivers for Microsoft <coughs> Access for Oracle and stuff. Here we're doing the same thing, but we're doing it with inside of a Java program in the JVM environment. And we don't have to actually tell it which data source. It's given for us with the driver support. So here we have, a, by definition, what I'm talking about, the data source is the database created using any type of common database application. So it's the source. And your system has to have a driver for the database. And then here we have um, MySQL server. And I, th I think the slide set actually shows you. In fact, if you go to jdbc.oracle.org, it still works. Actually, you can see the Connector J drivers. Uh, Connector J works with MySQL, and it also works with Oracle in terms of how the connection works. And the components that are going to make this work <coughs> is we have the uh, driver manager itself. The driver manager is going to load the database drivers, manage the connection between the application and the driver. Because what we're doing is kind of building a bridge between the Java application we're creating and the database connection. We're going to set up hopefully a web, you know, on your database end of it, which you need to do is set up an account that's supposed to be web accessible or driver accessible, which means you're going to set up an account that has very low privileges to it. It's not going to have admin privileges, hopefully. <laughs> 
You're going to set up a view, perhaps. You're going to have access to certain tables, certain information that's needed for the application that you're running. Your application connects to the database through this user interface. And there's only one connection. It runs, connects, runs a query, or gives it a statement. And I'll go through some of the syntax for that in a few minutes. And then it either comes back with a failed or uh, did not fail or it comes back with a result set, and they can take the result set and you can parse it out and do whatever it is that you need to do with it. Interesting thing is in that if you were here for the PLSQL lecture that I gave a couple weeks ago, I mentioned people like to use PLSQL because there's no conversion with data types. We can take and, uh, in fact, let me go back to the slide here because this is really what I'm talking about. We can go back and um, we can take PLSQL and actually take a piece of information from the database and put it in a table data type or put it in a row data type. And we can use it as whatever format it was originally. And there's no type conversions, there's no type casting, no change, which works with a native kind of concept. Well, that's what Java is trying to achieve. So PLSQL is a scripting language. It's um, used, uh, it's still highly used. And uh, it's limited, though. It's not a full-fledged, and as we've seen some of the features as I went through it for that particular lecture, and if you missed it, you can see it online. Um, it's used in a command line processing mode. You can build it in the back end of some GUIs. It has GUI components to it. It's not Java. <laughs> you know, Java is a full-fledged programming language with enterprise uh, networking capabilities and all sorts of different features. So what we've done is actually kind of taken SQL generically and put it into Java. And uh, what ended up happening is now we have the supported embedded SQL. And the drivers actually work with some of the embedded SQL statements and use SQL through the Java interface. So when we get a result set back, long story short, we're not doing any type conversions. We can actually get it back and use it as a result set that's in the format of the database that's in what we'd normally see as if we were using PLSQL, but we have the features of a full-fledged programming language is um, really the good point. The drivers are an abstraction on top of embedded SQL. We don't have to actually do this. It's an automation, which is why I want to show you the drivers. In the old days, before we had the driver support, we were doing everything manually. Now there's a six-step process, and you'll see how easy it is. And uh, Hopefully I'll, hopefully I'll have that, hopefully I'll have my Windows partition working and I'll, I'll make the YouTube video for you so you can actually see it run live. Because uh, it's it actually kind of interesting. It's just a little Echo client server, you know, but it uses a database connection and uh, it's, it's pretty cool actually to see it work. Uh, but what we're looking at is the driver, the connection, the statement, some metadata, result set that comes back out of it, automated through a high level API. And the API is using the Java SQL utilities, but it's easier. It's a lot easier. Okay, so I talked about the driver manager. That's what's going to load the driver. And the reason why I'm going over this terminology is because we're going to see it in action in a few minutes. You're going to go, connection, driver manager, why do we need to do that? All of these are all the components that are part of the big picture. So the driver manager is going to load the driver, manage the connection. And so then the other abstraction, the other class we're going to do is the driver itself, which is usually a third party. It's not made by Oracle. It's not made by Sun. It's not. It's actually made by, well, Connection J is the one that I'm going to show you. It's made by a third party company that, you know, put it together. The connection. So by term, the connection is the session that's going to happen between the application and the driver. The statement is going to be the SQL statements we're going to send back and forth. The metadata is going to be the information that's returned about the data. Same concept as we had before. And then we have the result set which is a logical set of rows and columns that's going to come back and we're going to put it into, we're going to put, we're going to make a class that represents, an instance of an object, essentially, that represents that already built in. So the support for the, uh, the database facilitates basically these components. We have the driver manager class. And if you don't know about Java, eh, you're gone. If, you, if you're in the Java programming class, object, you, you know all this stuff already. If you're new to this, just see if you can follow along and kind of, you know, relate it to any other programming language, because the same concept would work in C or C++, but it's going to be demonstrated in Java. <clears throat> but we have an object that we're going to create that's going to represent the driver manager. We have the connection, which is going to be an interface or an abstract class. Because the connection, if you remember abstraction, excuse me, abstract classes from the Java design class, we're going to build on it. 
because the connection is going to have information. It's going to have the URL, the login name, the password, all those pieces of information. We can't really build a base class from. We're going to basically build it from an abstract class. The statement interface, which is actually another class in itself, is going to make be an instantiation with the values that are of the actual SQL statement. All of these turn into objects, believe it or not, and then we have the result set interface, which is going to be another object. So we can run methods on the objects, essentially to say result set dot get next, get next, and go through the result set and stuff. So the Java SQL implemented via the classes and the package it supports SQL2. Mm, it's just generic SQL. You don't have to worry about the version. It supports modern SQL versions. It's not very backward compatible, actually. Uh, it doesn't support old versions of databases either. Um, in fact, it doesn't even support 11G either, which was part of my problem. So I ended up playing around with the Oracle get, to get the driver to load. Then I realized, well, 11G is too new. So I went back to 10G, and then that's where all the problems started. <laughs> so long story short. Uh, define objects for uh, remote connections and database. Execute queries. There's eight interfaces to define objects. And here are the interfaces. And kind of can think of these as objects that we're going to work with in this particular example. The statement object. The callable statement prepare statement, there's different kinds of objects. One that's going to either run something, one that's going to prepare something at a time and cache, cache the statement itself and run it multiple times. Because here's what you get in regular old internet development with databases. Is it's connect, you know, log in, connect, send a statement, get a result set, send a statement, get a result. Kind of, kind of time consuming, a lot of traffic going back and forth. So the driver in the JDBC method basically caches some information. You can have a statement that you're going to run multiple times and you're just going to get different parameters. That's where that prepared statement comes into, into play, place, and I'll show you an example of that. So you don't have to keep, you know, send, receive, send, receive, send constantly. You can automate, and it provides methods for automation. So you can give it a generic query. Let's say you're looking for books by a certain author. You know, instead of sending the whole statement all over again, starting the whole query all over again, you're actually kind of working in between, you're working with a cache set of data, and you're going back to it. Because any type of connection to a database, we know it's like a one-time shot. Go to the database, run it, wait, run another query, run another, it's always brand new, like, hey, where'd you come from? Run another query. So the, this particular method allows us to automate the process a little bit better, makes it more efficient, Especially across a distributed application makes it more user friendly. Actually, makes it easier to work with, um, which is why there's it's used a lot. Actually, uh, so we have the database uh, metadata, and the result set metadata, and the result set the connection, the driver. So we got seven steps, and uh, let's get this all on the screen. I don't like the way this slide set is working. <laughs> there we go. A little, oops, too many buttons. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so seven steps. We get the driver manager, the driver, the connection, the statement, the result set. And uh, believe it or not, you don't even have to take notes. You'll probably get this by the end of this. And uh, you know, hopefully I'll post a URL to that video. So we're going to load the driver, define the connection URL, establish the connection, create the statement objects, execute the query, process the results, and close the connection. And once you see this, you go, oh, I'm never going to connect to a database in any other way again. <laughs> This will automate everything. This makes it extremely easy, actually. Um, so, and the, the other beauty that you have is this is all enclosed in .class files. Not running from JavaScript, not running from PHP, not running from any type of script. And you can take your connection and all of this JDBC stuff and merge it in with other technologies and other Java-related things, shopping carts, all sorts of different things you're working with. So it merges in well, it mixes in well. So we got the loading of the driver, the first step. So we're registering the driver directly, automatically, by going class dot for name, and then we're saying org dot oracle driver. So what we're doing is we're running a method to automatically load a driver. So what we do is we, and you'll see this in the video, you download the driver, you put it in the same directory as your bin directory, which is probably the easiest thing to do in your Java folders, and then you just run a command to say, you know, load me. <laughs> Class dot for name, which is essentially is going to create an instance of the driver, which is a class. So the driver is actually connector J is one of the 
talking about is a third party, any driver works, which is great because if you don't like one driver, you can switch it. All you do is one command that you're changing, you just change the name. In fact, if you do a generic string, you just change the value of the string, you load a different driver, you connect to a different database, or you connect to a different system. So it creates the instance of the driver, it registers a driver with the driver manager. And uh, in a few minutes, I'll talk about the driver manager. Uh, but just to let you know, it's kind of like the RMI manager. Um, when you're working in a distributed environment, what you've got is uh, one computer running an application, you got another computer that's got the database on it, the Oracle system, you got MySQL system over here. You gotta have a manager to kind of figure out what you're interfacing <coughs> with, keeping track of all the connections. The driver manager just basically manages the connections. Because what you can do is essentially connect to multiple databases simultaneously. Uh, so you can search, if you're a bookstore company, you can search different publishers. Uh, publishing houses that have different databases, different locations, uh, and the driver manager is going to keep track of each one of the connection points. So you can send and receive back and forth simultaneously. And it, it's, you know, it's a manager because it's managing the network connections, essentially, uh, which is where it gets its name. So in terms of identifying the data source, this is the easy part. If the required information for making the connection to the database, specify the URL. And here's an example down here where we've got JDBC colon Oracle, and we have two internet locations, and the internet locations are going to be where the database is. We're working on the assumption that the database is not running on the same computer <laughs> as the application, uh, because if that were the case, why would we even have to use JDBC anyway? So what we're doing is kind of looking at a real-world environment, which we don't necessarily own the database, but we have connectivity to it. Another option is create an instance of the driver and then register it with the driver manager. And here we have driver, driver, legal driver with a class name and a new instance. Don't worry about the syntax at this point. What you're trying to do is get a feel for how easy it is. So, or maybe you're getting a feel for how complicated it might be if you don't know Java. I don't know. It is actually kind of simple when you think about it. Uh, when you start writing the code, then you notice every single JDBC connection is always written the same way. Kind of like opening up a file, closing a file, all the same process over and over again. So the connection, what we're doing, it represents the session with the specific database. So we can have multiple, well, we usually only have one driver. We can have multiple connections. We can have multiple queries. We can have multiple objects represented. If you think about it, you know, it's object orientation. We can have multiple instances of anything <coughs> that we want. So within the context of the connection, the SQL statements are being executed and the result sets are being returned in terms of the connection. And the connections, so we have multiple connections. Connections provide the metadata, the information about the databases, the tables, the fields, and then we connect the object, or connection objects has methods to deal with the transactions. Ah, where else do we get methods to deal with this stuff, which is great, because now we can add something, remove something, manipulate the table, excuse me, the result set, the information we got out of the table, with an object that has methods that have all the built-in functionality, which is great. Um, so in terms of creating the connection, uh, we use the get connection on the driver. So connection, get connection with a string, a username, a password. It's all, uh, it, we don't have to worry about security here because it's all inside a bytecode once it's compiled to a .class file. Connects to a given JDBC URL with a given username and password. And then uh, for those of you guys who have just sat through object-oriented programming, <laughs> object-oriented design. I talked about exception handling today. Built-in exception handling as well. Uh, so we've got, we're using Java exception handling from the SQL. Uh, so we have Java, SQL, SQL exception. Throw that automatically. Which, essentially what you're doing is now taking advantage of Java's connection handling, which can come back and actually give you the information that comes from the database. You can't get that when you use PHP to connect to the database. <laughs> because what is going to happen is when you have a PHP connection, you have what's called a lightweight. You don't have a connection manager. You don't have a driver manager. You don't actually have a connection. You have something that's going out, running a thread that's going out, that's doing, you know, running a query, and you're getting something back, and it's in a buffer. You're not getting all of the Oracle errors that are coming back. You're not getting any of the Oracle-related information. It's it's dumbed down a lot. So this is a lot more powerful in terms of exception handling. Another selling point for it. Returns a connection object. So the connection comes back, returns an instance of an object of connection as a type. 
And so here's an example of the source code that we've written for it. Uh, this one is actually using an Oracle driver, which is good. Uh, connection, connection, which we create an instance of connection. We're calling it the same name so of object type connection, driver manager, get connection. And then this one's going to be a movie database with a test users and a password, uh, just a sample that we have hooked up. So <coughs> after we've loaded the driver, we have established the connection. And then, uh, and I'll show you a complete program here in a few minutes to put all together. Then we have statements. Statements are kind of easy because, uh, you know, that's what we do. We're going to connect our database and we're in statements. So we have a statement object. And a statement object, we have a create statement, prepare statements, or a prepare a call in terms of callable statements. Uh, so create statement is kind of the easiest one. It returns a new statement object used for generic queries. You know, select star from this. Or do something. Uh, the prepare statement returns a prepare statement object. And it's for statements called multiple times with different values pre-compiled to reduce parsing time. So we can actually kind of cache it during the connection by the driver manager and keep track of it. More efficient way of running a query only works if you're going to do it multiple times. So it's a searching every database. Well, here's the interesting thing. What do we use databases for on the internet? Searching. <laughs> we don't really do that much updating to them. Well, we do updating, but we usually find information. We want to search through it, uh, which makes prepared statements very effective. Callable statements, so which is a callable statement object for stored procedures um, that we can use. So, and I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes. So the statement, so we have the object that manages the statement, and then we have the statement. <laughs> the statement object is used for executing the static SQL statement, and uh, it contains the results. It, the SQL statement actually produces results. It doesn't necessarily have to. And we have two choices. We have an execute query or an execute update. They're optimized. The methods and the connection and the entire process is optimized depending upon what it is. <coughs> Why use the same thing? So you use PHP, you have one. <laughs> Connect, run a query, run a query. Well, this is actually optimized. So we have two separate types of statements we have one that bothers with a result, result set, one that doesn't. Instead, the one that doesn't bother giving us a result set comes back with air, Oracle error messages and code, except IO exception handling and SQL exception handling, and gives us a lot more information about what went wrong. <laughs> if something went wrong, it doesn't worry about empty result sets that come back. In fact, we, didn't, we, we can use them differently because we're not expecting a result set to come back out of it. So execute query is used uh, for statements that return an output result. We're executing a query. We're going to we run a query. We're going to get an output. We're going to get a result set. Update is used for statements that don't have a result set. So no output is going to occur. So we have the result set. Um, the result set is what we get back from the, the query that we're running. And uh, it might be from an execute query or a string. Uh, so normally what we do is we take all the queries, we assign them to strings. We take the strings and we run them through the run them through the system essentially. Because why are we going to reinvent the wheel every time we're going to write an SQL statement? So we're not actually using um, we're not using embedded SQL inside of Java. So we're not having to bother with that level. So we write SQL queries just like the same way you write it, you know, for any other interface. So in terms of the result set execute query, the executed an SQL statement that returns a single result set. So in it, in terms of these are the methods actually, in it, execute update, it's going to execute an SQL insert update delete statement. Uh, it's going to return the number of rows that have been changed. Very similar to if you were in MySQL plus, excuse me, SQL plus window. It says one row created, one row deleted or something. It's going to give you the number of rows. And where else can you get a timeout? <laughs> PHP, actually, you can do it in PHP code. You can put a timeout in there. But the timeout doesn't actually test anything. It's just a timer. You can actually put a timeout on a connection and see when, if it's actually getting, it's, it's actually transmitting and receiving data and the connection is live and the database is performing something. We can adjust it. Uh, so we have a little bit better accuracy on it. So you can set a query timeout to set the timeout for the driver to wait for the statement to be completed. So we have information that's passing back and forth between these objects. 
each one of these is a separate object. And the driver manager can actually kind of come back and say, hey, uh, this statement's taking too long. <laughs> and not everything, we're not going to time out everything to start over again. Instead, that would be very crude, but sometimes you actually have to do that in other, other utilities, other interfaces. So the, accept, the operation is not completed at a given time, an SQ exception is thrown. Um, what is it good for? People who don't like to wait. Bad formed queries. Uh, let's, let's, let's go back here. There we go. Bad formed queries. Um, all sorts of different situations in which we don't want the user to leave the website <laughs> because the SQL query hasn't worked yet and they think the page is closed. I believe I talked about cursors in this class. Yeah, I did. Good. Guess what it supports? <laughs> cursors. <laughs> All right, what, what is the result of a query? And how can the database send the results of the query through communication lines? The answer uses a cursor. It uses the Oracle cursor. So if you missed the cursor lecture, I did that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, making sure I did. <laughs> it was a couple weeks ago, I think. And I went through some basic Oracle features, I think, at that same, same lecture. What are we looking at? We're looking at the information that's returned. It's actually part of the memory management system in Oracle, and part of the server application in which we have the memory that's storing not only the statement but the result set and all of the other information. And the Java driver manager works with the cursor directly. And that's why I say there's no translation, which is why people like this. P PHP. Other languages, there's a translation. You're not working with the cursor. You don't ever see the cursor. It's not part of the system. It's, you know, all you get is as if you were in an SQL window and you cut and pasted the results set out and you put it into another application. So it's working up at a higher level of abstraction. It's not actually working with a native information of, this, of the database. The result set provides access to the table coming from the cursor. The table of the data generated by executing the statements only one result set per statement can be opened at once, obviously. And the table rows are retrieved in sequence. The result set maintains a cursor pointing to the current <coughs> row of the data. It uses the same kind of cursor, but instead of doing it on the database end, you're doing it local. So it takes and caches the cursor locally so you can navigate through each one of the rows and all of the data. Uh, same way that you would do if you were sitting at an SQL Plus window or at the database using another connectivity method. The next method moves the cursor to the next row. You can't rewind. You can just go next, next, next. Because what you're doing is you're pulling it out of the cursor. It's no longer in the memory. So it's not like an array structure. It's, a, it's really a true cursor data format. Um, so working with the results set, we have the next and we have close. We don't have too much stuff to work with in terms of the result set. We can get at the meta metadata. We can find out what data type and what it's going to give us is the Oracle data type. Um, they, you know, so as another example, let's say we want to work directly with large binary objects. <laughs> we don't have that in other data types. We don't have that in other databases. Instead of having to define that in terms of the driver or the interface in the Java environment, if we pull it from the cursor and we get the information from the result set, it can tell us exactly what we have without having to interpret it or make put it into a different language. So in terms of the next, we activate the next row. So the first call to next activates the first row, returns false that there are no more rows. It's kind of crude, actually, but really just performs what it needs to perform. The uh, void close disposes of the results. It gets rid of the memory associated with it automatically called by this most statement methods. Uh, by most of the statement methods, will actually do a close automatically. Kind of supports um, the uh, well. It kind of supports the built-in garbage collection kind of environment or features, um, but it's not really garbage collection. It's not run by JVM. It's run by this particular methods that are doing it. So it's it's doing its own cleanup. It really didn't have to actually to leave it out. So. Getting the values from the row, we can type you know get type uh, in terms of the column index, the column name. So we can actually get at the native Oracle information of those particular columns information. So it returns the given field is the given type. So we can get get integer five. So what we can do is parse out the information and put it into Java terms automatically. So we can it's, it's get an integer, get a string, 
um, get whatever this where app actually happened looking at. And because it's Java, we don't have that particular data. We can actually build our own subclass. We can actually kind of create our own type. Uh, but every type in, in the world is supported. <laughs> so I rarely would have to need to do that. Uh, so in terms of the string, it's the same, but it uses the name of the field, so it's less efficient. So we can get the name, get, get the information out of the result set by the name of the column or by the information. Find columns looks up the given index, excuse me, given column name. <coughs> so looks up the column index given column name. We can find out that information. We can have support for null. So you don't get this in PHP or other JavaScript or other languages. I wouldn't use JavaScript to connect to a database, actually. PHP is very common, though. You see PHP with MySQL used all the time, the database connectivity, with PHP with Oracle. Usually, if they're using PHP, they're using MySQL for some reason. Is null. So SQL null means the field is empty. Well, actually, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean that it's null. <laughs> so we all know what null is. not the same as zero or empty. It's null. So the driver interface supports a concept in JDBC. You must explicitly ask if the field you're calling is null. So you can run a result set is null on the column to actually check for null. So you can figure out um, if the column is null. So we're going to map the Java data types with the SQL types. And part of the uh, translation that occurs is, is that we have similarities and we have built-in functionality for Java SQL to actually match up our types. And you'll see that the, they're fairly similar. Instead of the string in Java, we've got the variable character. That's about it. Uh, we have in the map, java.map, we have all of the different big binaries. Uh, big big decimals and the different translations that we hit here. A bit the Boolean short. It's, it's fairly um, it's actually fairly consistent in terms of the supported data types. So we can go type to type. We're not going to get exactly the same thing we get with PL SQL because we're not going to actually use because the PL SQL because it's actually talking, it's integrated more into the database itself as an interface we're actually using the same data type. Java, we're not using the same data type. We're using the cursor information, we're using as much, we're, getting, we're, we're a step up from the PLS, but we're not anywhere near what we're on with it in another language like PHP or something else. We're a little bit lower, but we're still not as low as the PLS goes, is what I'm saying. We still do have a, some sort of a conversion that's going on, because we're going from Oracle to Java. We're not going from Oracle to Oracle. The PLS is owned by Oracle. <laughs> so naturally, we're gonna have better support uh, and plus, it's a scripting language, which makes it a little bit more flexible as well. Uh, database time. So times in SQL are not non-standard. So Java defines three classes to help. We have the Java SQL date, SQL time, because as we've seen in uh, a lot of database applications, time, date, uh, the format of the particular columns is very unique, different than like dates and times that we store outside in programming languages. So we go, in terms of the data types, we go um, everything is in SQL, which is actually kind of nice. It works for Java, it works for MySQL, it works for everything, any database. It's going to be more database-related data types that are going to be stored in there. Timestamp, the year, the month, the date, the hours, minutes, nanoseconds. I usually use, uh, usually use this one in timestamp. Optimizing statements. Uh, so what we have here is... Uh, Prepared statements, uh, as I mentioned before, allows us to pre-compile a query and then just substitute some values in. So SQL calls and makes, uh, the SQL calls you make again and again and again allows the driver to optimize, compile the queries created with the connection prepare statement. So the prepare statement is done on the connection object and uh, that's where we get the prepared statements from. The stored procedures, those are written in database specific languages. And a procedure is sort of like a function. Let's consider it that way. It's a it's code that we're running in terms of uh, to calculate something, to do, uh, to, to do an adjustment on the database, to uh, add some automation to the process. Stored inside of the database, accessed with the uh, connection.prepare call. So we can run, which is another good feature actually, we run stored procedures. We didn't actually talk about stored procedures in this class, I don't think. <coughs> I think it's actually coming up maybe in the last lecture, <laughs> but, uh, um, or, or I skipped over it one of the one of the two. But uh, it's a way of storing little bundles of code <laughs> that we can uh, 
not real program code, but it's this. It's kind of like triggers. Can you talk about triggers? Yeah. Trigger is something that fires. It's a it's like a stored procedure that fires over and over again when a query is run or when an update or delete or something like that happens. And it, it's basically for house cleaning or for automation. Same thing on the stored procedure. It's, it's basically being able to cache code for an algorithm or something that you're running on the database to do some manipulations and update or something that you you want to have done. It doesn't actually have to change the table. It can do other stuff. It can calculate year-to-date sales or something, or it can perform any type of calculation on the data in the database. Uh, so. Here's our prepared statement example where we have prepared statement update <coughs> sales. So a string update sales is equal to update copy as an example, set sales. Well, we have uh, what we do is we create. You know, I've done a channel on any of us. We just create an SQL statement and we put question marks in. That's where the red is. And what are the question marks are? That means when we run this query, it's going to give us a prompt. And the prompt could be in a GUI interface, it could be in a command line interface where we're going to enter in. Yeah. Enter in, uh, set the sales to equal something where the copy is equal to something. So sales number, copy number. <laughs> so it's kind of a way of running it over and over again. Uh, and giving it information. So, so update sales is uh, the connection we got con dot prepare statement update string. And so we can basically update a bunch of stuff and then set run some statements to update the sales. And here what we're doing is we're just passing it. We're running a loop that says set integer one string number two to copy. And so what we normally do is prepare the statement, collect all the information from the user. Let's say the user's uh, updating something, like their address book or something. Uh, we can make all of the changes happen at the same time by keeping a list of all of the names, addresses, and things that have changed. And then when they update, take the entire list and process the list all in one batch. By preparing the statement ahead of time with the question marks in there and then creating a loop that goes through and says, okay, Barbara, this is a new address. This person, that's her new address. Because what ends up happening is we try to do it once after another. It makes the interface too <coughs> slow. Uh, update this one, okay, save. Because every time, if you think about doing an update, you got to go and connect to the database, <laughs> run a statement. This actually doesn't do that. It doesn't disconnect. It actually, the connection manager keeps track of the connections. So you're not disconnecting, connecting. You're only connecting once. You have it, this, all this information is being managed, preparing statements, you're sending information. And it's all actually kind of automated for you. So it's not like you're really connecting. It's like the database is right there for you. Here's the class diagram. It's just shows everything I've talked about so far. <laughs> outside of the uh, outside of the source code implementation, where we've got the uh, all the pieces working together. If you start over here at the beginning, this actually kind of starts and runs this way, and it comes around this way. So we have the driver manager, we get the connection, we can establish a connection object, which is over here. And uh, the connection object is, is essentially a run a create statement, prepare a statement, prepare a call. If it's going to run a sort of procedure or something. And then it's going to kind of drift from uh, right to left as we go through a different flow of, of information. So we can run multiple queries. We can run multiple statements and stuff like that. And eventually we're going to close the connection at the end, which is the last step, it's just to close all the connections. So. In terms of the metadata, this is the data about the data. In terms of the connection, we can get metadata. So our database metadata, get metadata, the result set is result set metadata dot get metadata. So we can get the metadata about the connection, about the result set, uh, which allows us to use the values a little bit more, um, a little bit more wisely, because at least we know what we're getting. One of the biggest problems with connecting to a database is looking at the result set, wondering, what's up for? <laughs> what's in there? It says one comma two comma three comma four. <laughs> what does all that stuff mean? Well, when you have it stored in an object, in an object or in a fashion, you know, get get the metadata. <laughs> it says first name, last name, telephone number. <coughs> this is all the information about the data that you wouldn't normally get. So the results that get made, what number of columns, how many columns are there in the results set, the names of the columns, the columns SQL type, uh, what columns are uh, Normal, maximum, width, and characters. Suggested column title for use for notes and displays. You know. What's a column's number of decimal places? Does a column case matter? Um, all this information actually.
actually can be, can be displayed. In terms of the da database metadata, what tables are available, <laughs> which might be interesting, and what our username and as known in the, by the database is the database in read-only mode, write-only mode. You know, what, what kind of access do I have? What kind of privileges do I have? Uh, the table correlation names are supported. Um, anyway, you can get all sorts of different databases related as well as table or column result set related data that comes back out of it. Useful methods of the metadata is getting the column counts. In fact, there used to be something that ODBC supports that with uh, like Visual Basic and some of the Visual Studio and .NET stuff. Um, so you're getting pretty much the same ODBC, but it's in a JDBC environment. Because um, you need to know the column count, well, sometimes, to know how many you're going to read, if you're going to parse the results that what you're going to do with it. The column display name, names, types, is it nullable? That's, an, that's a different one, actually. Is it null? Can it be null? Can it not be null? So imagine the case where you want to print the results. It might actually be nice to be able to print the result set as the result set which is what you're getting in from the native database connection. So. Transaction management. There's another good thing we have with the driver manager that we don't get with PHP or with other things. You know, if we want, we have to send a commit. We have to send in aborts. And do we still have the connection? That's a good question. You know, so it's not as reliable. So we have built-in transaction management as part of the JDBC interface. So the transaction is a sequence of statements, if we're not familiar with that. I think the last lecture, I think. No, no, no that's client server in the internet. I think I talk about transaction management. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to cover there any specifics upon that in terms of networking management, bottlenecks and stuff. But transactions are not explicitly opened and closed. Instead, the connection has a state called auto commit mode or no auto commit mode. <laughs> so. If you wanted to, which is kind of dangerous, you could put auto commit mode, turn it on, and then you don't have to worry if you lost the connection. Everything you've done has been saved. <laughs> or there's been a problem. Uh, so if auto commit mode is true, then every statement is automatically committed. Otherwise, it's false, and you have to go ahead and send a commit. So in terms of the auto commit, you're just basically turning on a Boolean. Otherwise, you can say connection.commit or connection dot rollback. So what you're going to do to explicitly manage the transaction yourself, you don't get that. You don't get that with like a PHP or scripting language connection because you're not getting the connection manager or the concept of the connection object the connection manager is taking care of that's watching. So you say connection dot come in, it's going to take the whole thing in terms of the connection. Come in all of the changes and things that you've done. Um, so that's really good if you're doing things with multiple different databases, for example, and then you can build it in with auto um, I.O. exceptions, and you can actually, you know, if there's an I.O. exception that causes some you know, doubt that the transaction completed correctly, you can just do a connection.rollback and start it all over again. <laughs> so it helps with the, uh, definitely helps with the, uh, with the, you know, with the air checking. So the connection manager for large threaded database servers creates the connection management object. We see. It's responsible for maintaining a certain number of open connections to the database. It uh, so when your application needs a connection, it just asks for the open connection manager pool instead of recreating a new one. Um, other scripting languages, you need a connection, it creates a connection over and over and over again. Here, it just do we have an open connection? If we do, reuse the same open connection. Don't bother with a new one. So why? Because opening and closing connections takes a long time. <laughs> so, KWC can actually speed up the process in terms of the connection manager. Warning connection manager should always set auto commit to false when the connection is returned, actually, because you don't want to, you don't have to have an open connection, have some transactions, parts of transactions being performed through it, and then the connection goes away. The connection gets closed, and it's auto commit, which might mess up some consistency between other connections that you might going on, because what you can do is have simultaneous connections going on and have simultaneous database activity going on for different levels of different tables or different purposes. So not only do you have it between users, but you can have it in the same application. And you can kind of create a multi-threaded kind of database connectivity that way. Usually in other scripting lines, you have one connection. <laughs> connect, disconnect, connect, disconnect. 
Here you don't have as much connect, disconnect, you connect. You do stuff for a while. When you're all done, you just connect. And we didn't actually see the close. So. You can go through the tutorial. Uh, that link still works. And uh, what do we have here? Um, that link actually still works. I want to see, I was waiting for to see if we had a source code example in here. I'm trying to refresh my memory on this example. Uh, this is like 80 or so slides, this lecture set. Uh, but what I wanted to do is kind of give you the overview of JDBC. Nope, it is not in there. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'll go ahead and put, it, put together that little example for you. And I'll make a YouTube video out of it when I get my system working. <laughs> when I'm not under a time constraint to get here to come to class or something, I can actually sit there over the weekend and put it together. Um, the second part of this lecture I rarely go over, actually. I leave it in here because it's nice reading if you have an interest in it. Um, what I've given you so far is the, um, the basics, um, which if you're new, it's probably over, overkill. And if you're experienced, you probably want to go through this particular second half, which is called Optimizing DVC. And it gives you the opportunity to kind of look at, you know, how do we make, because the reason why a lot of people use JDBC over other scripting languages is not only because they're programming something in Java, but because they want to optimize the database connectivity. And if you go through the second part, what you're looking at is, you know, the reasons why, basic API techniques, which we've already covered. And then looking at how to optimize, um, how to optimize the use, and it's usually in terms of whether or not you're going to create a prepared statement or a callable statement, where you're going to put the statements. This is where you can actually kind of say, well, let's create more stored procedures and put them on the database. And then let's just call them, call the procedures. And then we can automate it so the processing is happening on this big, huge server. It's not happening on our little database, I mean, on our little web server where we have the application going on. And the whole second half of this kind of goes through where you're going to cache the information. How are you going to parse the results set? How are you going to decide if you're going to use a prepared statement versus a regular execute statement? Or you know, basically, you know, how to design the application to make it uh, more optimal using flexibility. Um, get, gets into the prepared statement um, in terms of efficiency and an example about how to use it, stuff like that, which we've already kind of seen already terms of one example. And then uh, using a connection pool, the concept behind creating multiple connections, running multiple queries, and working with multiple results that simultaneously. Um, the pool is going to give us multi-threading, as I mentioned already, which is going to give us the right, same thing as threading does in applications. gives us twice the power, twice the processing power and speed um, simultaneously. So don't use the uh, get connection often. Because it takes uh, 0.5 to 2 seconds to create the connection. So what we do is we create a connection pool. We look for an open connection. We run the, product, we run the query for the open connection, uh, which is a way of making it run faster. Which is why this is actually kind of better on top of using it to database connectivity as a scripting language. Because you don't get this choice in a lot of the different other environments. I'm um, using multi-threaded connections, basically how I, what I just described a few minutes ago. Uh, single batch transactions, ah, querying transactions together, sending them in a group um, over multiple connections, and then running um, the transaction as an organized set of queries instead of doing them individually, uh, which is kind of an interesting concept. Um, so single batch transaction, Database obtains the necessary locks on rows, tables, releases it in one step, depending upon the transaction type. Separate statements and commits can result in more database calls. So basically, you're only locking it for one particular time for one particular transaction to complete. When you're completing it, you're committing it and moving on to the next transaction. So it's basically a way of organizing it. Uh, you don't have transaction span, user input. Oh, that's really bad. Yeah. I mean, if you've ever works with the web. In fact, people still do this, which is kind of weird. And uh, not, you don't have this feature, actually, with uh, most scripting languages. But if you're running a JDBC interface and you have an application that's opened up, and you have a user who's editing their personal information or preferences or something, and they're saying, oh, let's go, they go to lunch and they come back. The connection to the database is still active. 
their record's been locked <laughs> for all this time, and it's spanning all of the user input, and it's waiting for the transaction to be completed. Which, you know, if somebody else is trying to update that record, trying to do something, you have an open connection, you have an open lock on that particular record. Not so optimal, especially if you're trying to query it for something. Um, or if you're trying to, you're over in registration and you're trying to update that student account, it's, like, it's going to be locked forever. Um, so sending a begin the transaction, managing the transaction itself is basically the, the point. Smart queries, making queries as specific as possible is also another, another kind of concept. Um, people make queries big. In fact, people do this a lot in scripting languages. They give me everything. And they get everything, oh, let me take this, because they don't know what they want. <laughs> so in any type of JDBC or any other type of connection, optimizing the query, making it specific only getting the row you need, only getting the information out of the row you need, not all of it, can actually make it run faster, putting more logic into the SQL statements, uh, properties to avoid performance problems, avoiding nested queries, avoiding complicated joins, working with views is another component. Um, this is just an example. You know, Instead of this one, use that one. Which you're doing two selects. You're just doing a select from employees, a select from department, and joining on a Java application side, which is going to be pretty hard. Instead, you just run the query instead of joining it. The fact that people do that all the time, I'm not quite sure why. They take this result set, they put it into an array. They take this result set, they put it into an array. And then they like work with the arrays and they copy the arrays to another one and they do all this work. In there. It's like, oh, just make the query better. <laughs> you have one result set that comes back, you could just use that. So, smart queries. Minimizing the result set before crossing the network. The biggest bottleneck of JDBC with any connectivity to a database on an internet application is the line that all that data has got to go over. Slow connection, you got slow data passage. So don't send as much data. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. Many performance problems come from moving raw data around needlessly. Basic concept. Uh, smart querying, uh, using filtering, using Java for business logic, um, basically using some of the Java facilities, some of the interfaces. There's a lot of third-party tools, actually, that work with JDBC. You don't need that, actually. You can do a crude JDBC connection and stuff without working with those higher-level APIs. There's a lot of packages, like a lot of third-party tools. And it's almost like, you know, it's like if you just took the time to kind of get familiar and not afraid of JDBC, it's like it would be easier just to use the JDBC than use all this other stuff because you're adding on more objects and more stuff to it to build a higher level interface to it, which you probably don't even need. Uh, keep operational data sets small as possible, obviously, for sorting, for searching, and stuff like that. The smaller the set, these faster things run. Advanced driver tuning, uh, special options for each of the JDBC drivers, and this is. This is actually kind of interesting because certain drivers, which is why I like Connection J, is fast. Other drivers run slower. They take longer to load. In fact, the ones that are shipped, actually the ones that the Oracle development team works on, are slow. <laughs> but they're more secure. There's de definitely a lot more built-in exception handling and stuff in there. Connection J was written by another company, and it's just, it's just stripped out. <laughs> it's, it's a small little driver that runs pretty fast, actually. Um, no common standard at all. Um, improved performance by reducing the round trips to the database. So the Oracle driver performance extensions that they have out there as well. Oracle performance extensions, role prefixing, batch updates, things that you can do. And again, you're installing third-party tools, extensions on the Oracle system that's going to provide some efficiency for you in terms of the JDBC connection. When you go to out, in fact, I like to just search on JDBC, and you'll see a bunch of tools, a bunch of APIs out there for a bunch of different stuff um, to optimize the environment. Because what you could do is create a JDBC application very slowly, very inefficiently, quite easily. <laughs> Actually, it's not too hard. It's not too hard to do a bad job with it. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, um, without thinking about it, um, in terms of the Advanced driver tuning, if you wanted to get into a specialized driver, it uses client-side buffering, replaces round trips, local manipulations, it uses Oracle statement.set row fetch, using more of the built-in Oracle features or um, 
information. Batch updates, eh, you know, reverse, reverse uh, prefetching. In, uh, in terms of the summary, leveraging the strengths of the database with the application, knowing what to do in the database on the database side versus on the application side. Um, and the, the, the problem with that is you actually, in order to leverage that, you have to have access to the database. Usually you don't get that. Usually what ends up happening is you get a login. You don't get any control of the Oracle database. So then you have to build everything on the application side, <laughs> which in the best of all worlds is not the best approach, actually. It would be better to optimize things in terms of the database connectivity. Create a, a view or something, create something that makes the interface run a little faster. So that's where you get the advantages if you own the database and optimize it. Using the full range of the Java SQL API would actually be good. Learning embedded SQL in terms of how it works with Java. Designing for performance connection pools, multiple threading, implementing driver performance extensions, using some of those third party tools to maximize uh, the speed and the efficiency. Um, that was a quick run through, but I believe I had a, kind of a late start, so <laughs> we're, we're just on time now, which is good. And hopefully, you signed the roster. And I believe that next week we might be in a different room. I know I'm going to have a different setup. It might actually be in a different room as well. So, uh, stay tuned when you get here, just to figure out what room we're in. Any questions? There'll be a little bit of, uh, yeah, yeah, question. Okay, one of the slides in database connectivity, we are saying that one option can be used as a timer. The, uh, timer the timeout option. on the connection. You're actually. If I'm running a stored procedure, mm -hmm. millions of rows, how it is going to help? You can actually get a status on the connection. It says whether or not the connection has any failed codes or it has any. If the connection itself is timed out versus if it's just waiting, or there's information that you can get that comes back. Uh, it's not a hundred percent full full proof, and it depends on the driver support. And this is where the optimization extensions come into play. There are some drivers that do better management of the connection. They can tell and say the connection's live. The connection's working just fine. There's no problem with it. It's just we're running a long query. And then you can adjust the timeouts for that. There's some where it comes back and the connections fail. That we're kind of, the connection's coming back with a bunch of errors. Check for the error. <coughs> and what you're doing is kind of doing a try catch on it, looking for IO exceptions, looking for different problems that might be happening with the connection, and then adjusting the timeout. In scripting languages where you don't have control over the connection, what you're doing is picking an arbitrary timeout. Ten minutes, five minutes instead of building it upon any status indication or any IO exception handling that you might actually be able to implement. So if you build a, you can actually kind of build a timeout like, you know, two seconds or something. And then what ends up happening is, let's say, you run through a bunch of nested, going back to, to the previous class, object-oriented design, like, run a bunch of nested IO exception tries and catches, and the further you get down, eventually just run a timeout. <laughs> and you basically, you set the timeout to instantly disconnect. Because if you have this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, do you really want to wait longer? So that's what I meant in terms of the design of the timeouts. Um, it's not you don't. It's not really based on um, time, as it is on have we got a result? Are we getting anything back from the connection? And the status of the connection. And different drivers are going to give you completely different support for that, and different extension tools. This is going to that second set. This is where those driver extensions add more features, more, function, more functionality. But most of it's open source. You can't, or it's buy it with a toolkit. And then again, you're getting a bunch of stuff you might not necessarily need for one small feature. So it may or may not necessarily be something. The good thing is you can kind of build it into the application design. So. Uh, good question, actually, because I forgot to say all that. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. so my question actually was, will it be a tool for a database administrator? Because administrator, the one query is running for four minutes. You got the better query tools. Is for 10 minutes. Obviously, there's a tool yeah. has to be done for the database. There are better tools for that. There's better admin tools that are specifically designed for admins. Um, you have limited access from a JDBC. You can say if the connection's there or the connection's not there. <laughs> And all I can do is check for errors. All right. Any more questions?
Come on. You're all done? Okay, we're all done.